Good morning, Mission Church. We are gonna be starting in just a couple of minutes, but as you can tell, the room is filling up. If you can scoot to the middle of your row to make a little bit more room for those who will be coming in later. Once our service starts at 10, it gets pretty full and we need to have some help finding people. So if you could scoot into the middle of your row, leave some room on the ends, that would be super helpful. Thank you in advance, we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Mission Church this morning. I would like to extend a special welcome to anyone who is visiting us for the first or second or maybe third time. Maybe we haven't met you yet. We're glad you're here. And also a special welcome to friends and family that might be here for our parent and child dedications. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. My name is Tracy Grease and I am the children's director here at the Mission Church, and I have the privilege of welcoming you and being in here for a little bit this morning as we do have a special service where we will be celebrating with three families who will be coming up and promising in front of everyone to raise their children according to God's word, and so we're excited for that this morning. If you are a visitor or a guest checking out the Mission Church and would like to know a little bit more, we would love to invite you to a guest reception right through those doors over there as soon as the service is over. You can go in and have a chat with some of our folks, meet our pastors, and ask anything you ever wanted to know about the Mission Church. We'd love to have you and love to meet you and get to know who you are. Would you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved by faith, and this not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Would you remain standing with me? as we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for that grace. We thank you this morning, Father, for everyone that is here today, everyone that made a place in their schedule this weekend to be here, to hear about you, to sing about you, to learn about you, to be taught about you. Father, this morning, as we continue in some interesting and difficult, maybe, maybe surprising, maybe new conversations, Father, we do pray this morning for open hearts and open minds. 
as your word rests on us. Father, I thank you for the preparation that Pastor Mike has gone into to present to us some truths from your word. Father, we thank you this morning also for the families that will be dedicating their children before you and before our people here today. Father, we love you and we thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please stay standing as we enter this time of worship together, singing songs to worship our God. Let's do it. Church, let's sing together. The praises now awake the dawn. We'll greet your mercy with a song. Your people stand and sing for all your loving kindness. You carried us in faithfulness upon the paths of righteousness. The gracious King, you love us with your love.
a seat. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you here. My name is Mike Rose. I'm the senior pastor at the Mission Church. I want to welcome you. I want to welcome those of you who are connecting with us online today as well. Today, we are privileged to be able to uh, help three families dedicate themselves and their children to the Lord. And this is really an important um, act that they are doing today. Uh, this is not a confirmation. It's not a sign that their children are born again and followers of Jesus. But what it is, is these parents are recognizing and confessing before this crowd that they recognize their children are a gift to them from God and that they have a sacred responsibility. And that is to raise their children in the ways of Christ, to teach them the gospel, to live out the gospel before them, and to share it with them regularly in the hopes that as they share and as they pray and as they model that their children at the earliest possible age will come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, we as a faith community pledge ourselves to do all that we can to support them and encourage them along the way because those of us who are a little older, and I'm now a little older, right? We know that raising a family is not an easy task. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, I'm right. It's difficult. Uh, it's rewarding, but it's difficult, and we want to do all that we can to help them as they take their spot in history, so to speak, raising their children uh, and doing it in a way that it honors God and points them to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we have, we have three families. Each one has prepared their own testimony that's going to be on the screen. So right now we'll turn our attention to those testimonies, and when those are complete, the families will be here with me and we'll pray for them. So let's see their testimonies now. My name is Justin Bowers. This is my wife, Erica, and our son, Quentin. Quentin, your dad and I, along with many others, have been praying for your life long before it began. Your life is a true answer to many prayers and is a constant reminder of God's faithfulness and overflowing, undeserving love. You are such a blessing to us, and we are so honored that God has put you in our family and let us be your parents. However, we know that parenthood is hard, and we can't do it alone. You have amazing people around you, including your family, friends, and church family. These are people who will love you and will hold your dad and I accountable in raising you in a way that reflects the gospel and points you to Jesus. Today, we are dedicating Quentin Charles as a public display of our faith. We are committing to raising Quinn in a household that loves and serves the Lord and pray that one day he will develop a personal relationship with Jesus himself and will know Jesus as his Savior. We are asking our families here today and the church body to help us. We ask that they hold us accountable as we walk through this new chapter as parents. Church, first and foremost, we ask for your prayers. We ask that you pray for Erica and I's marriage to be a reflection of the gospel for Quinn and others that we will continue to love and serve each other well. We also ask that you pray for Quinn that he will one day accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. We ask that you pray for our family as a whole as we navigate day-to-day -day life with the newest member of our family, and we also ask for your love, support, and accountability as we parent Quinn. Hey church, I'm Eric and this is my wife Paige Hamer, and this is our daughter Louisa Kay. We're here today to uh, dedicate her before you. We know that Louisa is a gift from God, and we want to um, just cherish that gift and to um, use it wisely. So we want, to, um, we want to say that we're going to raise her in a godly church, and we just want to come before you to say that. We know that dedicating her uh, doesn't assure her salvation, but instead it's just our commitment to raising her in a, uh, in a godly church and a godly family. We, we want to uh, pray without ceasing over her salvation and her sanctification. And we know as we raise her, our goal is not behavior modification, this actually heart transformation. So we're not looking for her just to be well behaved, but we want her to uh, just recognize uh, her need for a savior. As we pray for her, I can't help but think about uh, Psalm 127, and that's the uh, that's the chapter that compares uh, children to arrows in a man's quiver, and it says, "Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them." Uh, and the point of arrows is not to uh, keep them in the quiver, but to actually uh, fire them so they go out into the world. So as we raise Louisa, we want to send her out into the world uh, fully prepared. Um, <laughs> we want to uh, 
we don't want to hold on to her, but uh, as a gift from God, we want to send her out. And we want her true target to be Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So uh, please join us in praying for Louisa. Uh, pray that God reveals her sin to her, that she will um, come to faith in him and want to be baptized and commit to following Jesus for her life. Um, Louisa's name means renowned warrior. And pray with us that she'll live up to that name from the kingdom of God. And uh, just pray that her life will be marked by uh, equal amounts of truth and also love and grace. So. We thank God for the blessing of a daughter, and we thank you all for your help in raising her. We love you, Louisa. Hi, I'm Jared Lung, and this is my wife, Brittany, our son, Sterling, our daughter, Savannah, and today we're dedicating um, our new daughter, Scarlett. We moved to Iowa from California last year because we wanted a safer place for our children to grow up. A passage of the Bible that means a lot to us and that helped led to this move is John 15, 5 through 8. And it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my, to be my disciples. And this verse reminds us that um, just as a branch needs to be connected to the main plant in order to live, uh, we need to remain constantly connected uh, to Christ. When we moved here, we made a list of a few churches that we wanted to try out, and the Lord led us to try out the mission first. Um, we felt instantly connected and welcomed by the pastoral staff and members of the church. And when our children, who had previously been scared to go off on their own, told us how much fun they had in the children's church, we knew we had found our church home, and we haven't gone anywhere else since. We're dedicating Scarlet today because being rooted in prayer and in the Bible and Bible reading are necessary components of life, and we know that this church family will continue to help us give our children the fuel that they need to grow and follow the Lord. Amen. So, uh, families, if you would make your way on up here. What a testimony that each one of them gave. And I want to say it certainly sounds like these children have been entrusted to some good parents, wouldn't you say? Their intentions are certainly honorable. And I have no, uh, no doubt that they'll actually move in the direction of those intentions and that they will seek to do exactly the things that they have said. So we want to take a moment now to pray for them. Hi, honey. How are you? She's just staring at me like, oh, wow. <laughs> we want to take a moment to pray for them. And church, I want to just remind you that this isn't just a ceremony, okay? This is for real. This is not only their commitment, but our commitment to them. And, you know, as our brother said here, found a home here. People making them feel welcome. And that's wonderful. But we want to also do what we can to be supportive in, in, as they raise their kids. And so uh, would you stand with me and join me in prayer as we pray for these families? So Father, we ask you now that to look down upon these families and these children. I know that you are here and that you are witnessing all of this. And Father, I just pray that as these parents come before this congregation and stand before you, that this will be um, a, a time that they will remember when raising of their children is challenging and difficult and perhaps even <laughs> you may wonder as a parent why did we do this <laughs> nonetheless there's so many wonderful opportunities and wonderful memories to be built and i just pray lord that you will sustain them by your grace through all of the various ages and stages of life and lord that you would empower both the men and the women to fulfill the roles that you've given them as husband and wife, as father and mother. I think of Justin and Erica. And I pray, Father, that you would just strengthen them to raise Quentin in the ways of Christ and that Quentin will come to know Jesus and will grow up to be a mighty man of the faith. I pray for Eric and Paige and their daughter, Louisa. Lord, I pray the same, that you would protect their marriage, encourage them as parents, and that Louisa would come to know Jesus as her Savior, and that she would grow up to be a mighty woman of the faith, and Lord, one who points others to you. 
And we pray for Jared and Brittany and their daughter Scarlett. And we pray, Lord, that you would encourage them, strengthen them, provide for them, protect them, and enable them, Lord, to raise Scarlett in such a way as that she comes to know Christ as her Savior and Lord and becomes a mighty woman of the faith as well. And so, Lord, as this young one is crying out, <laughs> we cry out to you, and we ask for your blessing upon them, upon this church, as we seek to honor you by helping people become fully functioning followers of Jesus Christ. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give these families a round of applause. All right. I think Louise is going to become a singer, right? Yeah, she's just going at it. All right. God bless. Thank you so much. How about if you guys stay standing as we... Yeah. I know today is one of those days, standing up, standing down. But let's continue to worship this morning. Grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free for the wonderful grace of Jesus. Reaches me. Come on, split up. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountains. Sparkling like a fountain. All sufficient grace for even me. Rather than the scope of my transgressions. Father, than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Let's sing wonderful grace. Wonderful grace of Jesus reaching to all the Thank you, Father. 
wonderful grace of Jesus. Sometimes I'm strong, sometimes I'm weak, sometimes I fall in my wandering. But through it all, there's just one thing more precious than the air I breathe. Grace, amazing grace, church. unfailing grace that saves my soul. Grace, unending grace, unrelenting grace that won't let go. You took our sin, you took our stain, you took our guilt, now there is no shame. That's our reward, eternal crown, the endless song. grateful for his grace how about if you put your hands together and worship him this man we are grateful for his grace how about if you stand oh, i have a seat i'm sorry
Well, where's my sermon? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I have that. What I don't have is the little announcement sheet that I needed, but I think I can make it do. So basically, we have a very special week coming up in June. It's called Go Week. Starts on June the 12th through the 18th. Thank you. And uh, this past Wednesday, we put out a very special uh, midweek connection. It's a video uh, that comes out every week. And this past Wednesday was dedicated to explaining Go Week uh, in detail and to encouraging you, the church, to uh, find a place where you can serve and uh, use the gifts that God has given you. So I want to encourage you, if you've not yet seen that video, please take a few moments, about 20 minutes, I think, and watch it. Pastor Brett did a great job explaining what's going to happen during Go Week. And uh, you'll be informed and you'll be ready then come June the 12th as we have a special Sunday to kick it off and then a, a week of activities that allow us to not only serve uh, in the body but also in the community. If you're new to the Mission Church, perhaps this is your first Sunday. I want you to know that we are all about teaching God's Word, the Bible. And, and we do that here um, expo expositionally. <laughs> I was about to say something else. And expositional teaching of the Word basically means that we take a specific book of the Bible, and currently we're in Romans, as most of you know, and we move through that book, whatever it is we're teaching through, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and as we've done this in Romans, it has brought us to Romans 8, 29. And uh, having arrived there, uh, in the verses that surround 8, 29, we uh, found four words in the text that uh, form, or from which, the two primary frameworks concerning the doctrine of salvation have come. And those words are called, foreknew, predestined, and elect. The two primary doctrinal frameworks that come from all of this are called Calvinism and Arminianism. And I took time last Sunday to go through the points of those, to define them, to help you understand what they uh, uh, speak uh, to the issue of salvation. And then we took time to actually just look at the Scripture and let certain Scriptures just speak for themselves as we uh, looked at, so what does the Bible have to say about those topics? And if you'd like to see that sermon, if you haven't had a chance to do that, or you're brand new to the church and you'd like to know what we had to say about that, our website is themissiondsm.org. Very simple, themissiondsm.org. Go to the sermons tab and you can find last week's sermon there. Today's focus falls to a question that eventually gets asked when we talk to people about the word predestination, specific from a biblical salvation context. I want us to define the word. We'll take a look at just a couple of scriptures that speak to the word, and then we'll turn our attention to deal with the question that I'll introduce here in just a few moments. So the word predestined, what does it mean? It simply means to determine in advance. That's what the word predestined means, to determine in advance. It also, we could say it this way, it means to settle an issue before the issue arises. So that's basically what the word predestined means. A couple of scriptures. The first one, Romans 8.29, says this, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his Son. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5a. Say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Now, these two scriptures that I have read for you here this morning communicate this simple thought, that before God created, before he created, he knew those that he would rescue from sin's condemnation 
And he knew them even before there was sin or the condemnation that goes with it. So before creation, before sin, before condemnation, before any of that, God foreknew what would transpire. He foreknew those that he would redeem, and he chose to do that before he even created. That's what those scriptures are saying. Now, when we come to the issue uh, of this predestination, the following question will inevitably be raised. One of the ways it gets uh, put is this. If God predestines some people for salvation, meaning predestines them for heaven, does he also predestine the rest to condemnation to hell? That's one way it gets asked. Another way is, uh, does God create some for heaven and create others for hell? It is quiet in here. That's a great question, isn't it? Does God create some people for heaven and some for hell? That's the issue that we're going to deal with today in this second sermon on soteriological misconceptions. The title of today's sermon is, Are Some People Divinely Predestined for Hell? you got to know this is a heavy topic, <laughs> and I'm feeling it. So I want to read three additional scriptures that are going to be foundational to the teaching I'm going to bring forth today. And I just want to get them out on the table, and then we'll dive into the topic itself after we have prayed. The first passage that I want to look at is Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. And it says that the Lord God took the man, that is Adam, and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We move on then to Romans chapter 5, and we look at verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that is Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, to all humanity, because all sinned. And finally, I want to read from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. These are the words of Jesus. He says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Heavenly Father, I pause now to ask of you for everything that we need to be able to not only communicate accurately and clearly, but also in an understandable way. And I pray for all of us who are here in the room, as well as those who are connecting online, that your spirit would do a divine work to help each of us to hear your word, to understand the word, and to begin to grasp what you would have us do, both individually and even corporately, with the word that we find before us today. I know that the enemy would love nothing more than to create controversy and um, division and uh, rancor and all the rest, but I'm asking God that you would divinely intervene and keep that from happening. Help us, Lord, to just come to the text honestly and to receive what it tells us and then let your spirit help us as we seek to apply it in the days to come. And um, I pray this for your glory and for our benefit. Amen. Uh, the answer to the question that I posed a few moments ago, I believe, begins in Genesis. And it begins with God's design in creation. Follow along with me as I highlight a few points of that. It was on the third day of creation, Genesis 1.12, that God began to create living things. 
We find in that passage that God created plant life. And while plant life is not the same as our life, it is life nonetheless, and it's the beginning of God's recorded creation of living things. On the fifth day, Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, we find that he created fresh and saltwater fish, birds, and also mammals that live in the ocean. On the sixth day, Genesis 1, 24, we find that God created livestock and insects and beasts of all kinds. And with each of these creations going all the way back to the third day, we find this statement following the pronouncement of the various creations according to their kind. Say that with me. According to their kind. That statement that we find there tells us that God placed certain uniquenesses into each kind of plant, fish, bird, insect, livestock. He placed within all of them certain uniquenesses, and he also placed within them the ability to reproduce according to their kind. Not only according to the physical attributes that each one possesses, but also the internal nature that brings about certain kinds of behaviors. And as God completed each creation, he declared each one to be good. Meaning, it's exactly what it should be. It is the perfect example coming from the perfect being who brings it into existence. At this point, we find God creating again. And this creation is his crowning glory, so to speak. He creates mankind. He creates humanity. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the, uh, of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, Genesis 1.26. Genesis 1.26 basically is an overview, a big picture of God's creation of mankind. If we go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and also verses 21 through 22, we get a, a, a more detailed record of that actual creation. Um, verse 7 tells us, uh, Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground, from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. We go to verses 21 and 22, and we find, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. All right? So we come to truth point number one. There are eight today. Truth point number one. The only humans that God personally created were the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. I pause for a moment because I do wonder, have we ever thought about that? Has that reality ever actually crossed our mind? That the only humans that God personally took action to create were the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. The record tells us that God created Adam's body from the dust of the ground, and having created that body, he breathed into it the breath of life and Adam became a living soul. He created Eve from a rib taken from Adam's side, and he brought her to life. And here in this passage, we find two specific hands-on creations by God of humankind. 
Now, while that soaks in just a little bit here this morning, let me ask this question. If God only created two humans, then how did the rest of us get here? How did the rest of us get here? And the answer to that is found in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, and I'll also eventually read verse 31. Verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Truth point number two. By God's design and power, he placed within the body of the first man and woman the ability to procreate. The ability to procreate is the ability to bring new human life into the world according to their kind. I don't know if it's dawned on us, but God is not in heaven creating new humans and then sending them into the world through the body of a woman. That's not the way it works. The way it works is God created a man and he created a woman and he infused creative power within the male and female body. And we know that as those bodies come together, contributing their part for procreation, new humans are conceived and born into this world. We had the perfect example of it right up here on the stage this morning, did we not? Now those children that we saw are no less the creation of God in the sense that God put into their parents the ability to procreate. If God had not put his power into their bodies to procreate, they would not have been able to do that. But God was not in heaven making those little babies and sending them through their mothers, and here they are today. He created one man, he created one woman, and he gave them the power to procreate, and of course that gets handed down. And I want you to notice the final statement of God's creation of male and female, all of the rest of creation that he made, to include the procreative power that he invested in them. Verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it wasn't just good. It was what? It was very good. Very good. So we find by God's design and power that Adam and Eve were created perfect. Spirit, soul, body, they were able to relate to the creation around them. They were able to relate to one another, and they were able to relate to God. Truth point number three. <clears throat> God's creation of mankind had only one intention, eternal life and communion with himself for his glory and creation's benefit. Somebody says, we had two lines there. It sounds like two intentions. Well, one intent can be explained in two or three sentences, right? So this is one intent that comes down and is explained to us in this way. God's one intention in creating man and woman, humanity, was that they have eternal life and that they have communion with him for his glory and for creation's benefit. I sum all this up by saying that God directly created two people, and only two people. And in their creation, we find no hint of any ulterior motive. Meaning, other than the motive that I've just given you. They were created to know God. They were created to love God. They were created to enjoy Him forever. What a glorious beginning. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? 
Some of you say, no. Okay, that's okay. I think it would have been awesome to be there. Of course, that would create other problems, right? Because my time was way down the line. What a glorious beginning, though. Created to know God. Created to love God. Created to enjoy Him forever. So what happened? What happened? And who's at fault? And what is the consequence? That's where we're going now. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how long Adam and Eve were in Eden before sin appeared. But we come to find out that it did appear. Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 6 tells us that the serpent deceived the woman and she ate the forbidden fruit. Adam was not deceived, but he took the fruit that his wife offered him and he ate it also. And verse 7 tells us what happened. Then the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. This is where sin enters the world. Not in their nakedness. They had already been that way. But in knowing that they were naked, it was this, it was, it's like somehow the, the corruption of sin caused them to feel ashamed. To feel fearful. To feel vulnerable. Guilty. And the sowing of the leaves really is just their attempt to cover it up, to find a way within themselves to fix the dilemma that they now find themselves in. Truth point number four. It was the singular act of disobedience by Adam that plunged not only he and Eve into sin's curse, but also the entire human population. Don't change any slides yet. I want us to look at that again because this is such a key thing for us to understand and I want you to remember the question. The question that I asked earlier on. It was the singular act of disobedience by Adam that plunged not only he and Eve into sin's curse but also the entire human population. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. Ah, oh, the women, they're, they're left out. No, it's, we know what that means. It's all humanity, right? Spread to all humanity because all sinned. Now here's another really important truth point. So I want us to really focus strongly on it. Truth point number five. Adam's sin caused Adam and Eve's nature to change. No longer innocent. No longer perfect. Their spirit died. Meaning that it was cut off from relationship with God. Adam and Eve were created with a certain nature, a nature that could love God, could know God, could enjoy Him forever. When Adam sinned, their nature, that internal, intangible part of life, changed. No longer perfect. No longer innocent. No longer able to actually know God as he is or to love God as they should or even to enjoy him forever. They were cut off from the relationship that they had enjoyed with God. God had created them in perfect innocence but now fundamentally changed. God's declaration of good could no longer be applied and so it was in this condition that Adam and Eve conceived a child. And that child was born with the same fallen nature 
that they now possessed. Are you following with me? In keeping with God's design and creation, that every living thing reproduces after its kind, from that point forward, every human with Adam's seed within them receives Adam's fallen nature and is born into this world fallen, imperfect, spiritually dead, cut off from God. Let's let that soak in for a moment. That's some heavy stuff. Everyone who was born with Adam's seed in them, you say, Pastor, how many is that? Well, it's everybody but one. There's only one person, one human, that came into this world who did not have Adam's seed in him, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He came through the woman just like all the rest of us do, but he was conceived in her womb by the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, he did not have Adam's seed in him. And he was not born fallen. He was not born cut off from the Father. He was born, humanly speaking, as Adam was originally. Innocent, perfect, exactly the way that he was to be. Now as we think about the question, how many is that, Pastor? They tell us, that give or take a, a few hundred million that there are seven billion people on the planet living right now. I want you to try to think about how many people have ever lived on the planet since the beginning. That number would have to go into the tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions. That leads me to truth point number six. When you trace the biblical account of creation, the fall and human procreation you discover that it was Adam, not God, who predestined humanity to sin's condemnation. You see, Adam's sin caused a consequence to fall on every single person with his seed in them before they even came into life. That's called predestination. God did not predestine humanity to condemnation. He did not predestine people for hell. But Adam did. His one action put all of us, as Romans 5.12 says, in that pathway of being cut off from God, spiritually dead, condemned, not only because of his sin, but ultimately because of our own which we all commit. I want you to look up there <laughs> and over here. All those dots that you see are meant to represent the totality of humans who have Adam's seed in them. We are all Sinners and put into condemnation because of Adam. God's intent was eternal life and communion with man. Adam's actions put himself and his progeny at odds with God, sold into sin, condemned in the pathway of eternal death. Now at this point, I want to invite you to follow me to a very well-worn passage of Scripture where I think Jesus backs up what I'm saying. John chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. As we go to John chapter 3, we find a familiar story to those of us who've been around church, Sunday school and such for a number of years. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, and Nicodemus secretly came to Jesus by night because he wanted to inquire of Jesus about some of the things that Jesus had been teaching. And he has this statement that he makes about, well, we know, Jesus, that you, you know, works that you do and such, you have to be from God. 
And, and, and before they even get too much into the conversation, we find Jesus abruptly and pointedly interrupting Nicodemus and telling him this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. As their conversation continued, we find Jesus then offering what has become arguably the most widely known and well-known scripture in the Bible. It's even put on big pieces of cardboard at sporting events. John 3.16 Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But it's the next two verses and statements by Jesus that I want us to focus on this morning. He goes on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might, the word might doesn't mean it's going to happen, but for everybody, but might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And so Jesus tells us that the Father did not send him into the world to condemn it. Why? How so? Two reasons. Number one, because condemning humanity was never God's intent. Never his intent. God's intent, as I've said several times now, was to enjoy, for man to enjoy eternal life and communion with him. So it was never his intent. Number two, God did not need to condemn the world because Adam's sin had already done that. The world that Jesus entered was already condemned. So he didn't come to condemn the world, it was already there. And so what we find here, the stated reason by Jesus himself is that the Father sent him in the world so that salvation, not condemnation, could be offered to the world. Okay? Keep thinking about that question. Did God create some for heaven and create others for hell? Despite the fact that Jesus confirms that he was sent so that salvation, not condemnation, could be offered to the world, let us not think that God is sweeping man's sin under the rug and ushering everyone into heaven because he's not. And we find the clarifying statement in verse 18. And I've added to verse 18, if we want to go ahead and move there, some, the extra red is my words, not the scripture's words, but they're there to help us Grab something. Jesus clarifies this by saying, whoever believes in him, that is in Jesus, is not condemned. Why is it that those who believe in Jesus escape the condemnation they were born under and garnered for themselves because of their own personal sins? Well, it's because the cross and the resurrection deal with our condemnation, right? Right? Jesus bore our sin. He bore your sin. He bore my sin on the cross. He became sin for us that we might be able to become the righteousness of God in him. And so those who believe in him, well, they're not condemned. The cross and the resurrection deal with that. But he goes on to say that whoever does not believe is condemned already. It's not that they're going to be condemned for not believing somewhere down the road. They're condemned already. And their condemnation is secured because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. To say that they're condemned already is to say this. That we are born into a stream of sin. 
We are born into a stream of condemnation. Those who do not come to that place in life where they turn in repentance and faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, they don't get condemned down the road. They just continue on in the condemnation they came into the world with. In other words, God just lets them go where they naturally want to go. You say, Pastor, no one wants to go to hell. And I believe that. That's probably true. There's a few rock songs that tell us otherwise, but those were probably just for the prophet's sake. Fun to sing in an arena, right? But nobody wants to go to hell. But the point is, man within himself does not want to surrender to the authority and sovereignty of God. And so those who do not want to surrender to the authority, the sovereignty of God, to the grace that Jesus provided through the cross and the resurrection, they continue on. They continue on to an ultimate end. Truth point number seven. God's intention is clearly seen in his creation of Adam and Eve in a state of perfect innocence. Despite Adam's sin, plunging humanity into condemnation, God's intention continues in the coming of Jesus to provide a means of redemption for sinners. What am I trying to do here, church? I'm trying to answer the question, did God, does God choose in advance to send people to hell? Did he create people for hell? I'm not finding that in the scripture. He had a different intent. Will people go to hell? Yes, they will. But not because God created them for that. Because that's not why he created. And his sending of Jesus is proof that his intent is eternal life and communion with him forever. Because isn't that the gift that we receive through the resurrection and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. So let's return to the original question. I want to state it again and give you the last truth point. And then we'll begin to sum this up. The question was, if God predestines some people for salvation, meaning for heaven, and he does, does, that, does he also predestine the rest to condemnation or to hell? Put the other way, did God create some people for heaven and others for hell? Truth point number eight. Scripture is clear. God did not predestine anyone for hell. Rather, Adam's actions alone predestined his progeny to sin's condemnation. There's a second part. I just want to hold here for a sec. I want to read that again. Scripture is clear. God did not predestine anyone for hell. Rather, Adam's actions alone predestined his progeny to sin's condemnation. Part two. God, however, foreknowing the fall of mankind into sin's condemnation, determined before creation, I wish I had to put these next words in bold, to save some out of sin's condemnation for his glory and for their benefit, Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. God, however, foreknowing the fall of mankind into sin's condemnation, determined before creation to save some. That right there demonstrates God's mercy, his love, his kindness, and his grace. Even so, Despite the fact that that shows his mercy, his love, his kindness, and his grace, despite that, I can already sense and feel and somewhat hear the protest rising from some. Saying, 
That's not fair. That's not fair. It's not fair that God would choose to save some and leave the rest in their condemnation. Not, not that he created them for that, but leaving them where they are. That's not fair. Well, if we're going to say that, why don't we go ahead and add these words? That's immoral. That's unethical. That's illegal. Does that mean if it's unfair... It's those other things too. So let's just go ahead and heap all of those adjectives on God. What I'm about to tell you is not easy to hear. And some may even be offended. I hope not, because that's not my intention. It's not my intention to empty this room out so that me and Brett and his kids are the only ones that show up next week for church. <laughs> that is funny. A little levity before we get to the, the hard stuff. But listen to me carefully, church. We must come to grips with the fact that through our association with Adam as the federal head of the human race, and we must come to grips with the fact that from our own personal sins against God, divine condemnation is what we deserve. And that condemnation is just, and it is righteous, and it is moral, and it is ethical. It is even legal. We've got to deal with that. Fair? We want to throw the word fair around? Let's talk about fairness or lack thereof. I'll tell you what's unfair. Jesus lowering himself from heaven to take on human flesh, his own creation, to clothe himself in his own creation. To then live in that body in absolute perfection in relation to God's law. But then by all others around him to be lied about and to be tortured and to be hung on a cross like a heinous criminal. Taking the sins of humanity upon himself. Bearing the full wrath and fury of God for sin and then dying for me, dying for you. Fair? That's what's unfair. And yet that's exactly what he did. He didn't put you on that cross. He didn't put Gabriel on that cross. The Creator put himself on that cross and bore our transgressions which demonstrate again his intention. And why did he do it? Love. First of all, love for the Father. Second of all, love for the glory of the Godhead. And third, love for sinners. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the sacrifice for our sins. Mark it down on your note guide. 
It is a fact that in love, God saves sinners. Here's the million dollar question. Will he save every sinner? No, he will not. He determined to allow many sinners to go the way that they want to go. And the way that sinners want to go is in opposition to him. But he nonetheless saves sinners. He determined this before he even created. He knew us. He provided for our redemption. He called us. He justified us. He sanctifies us. And he will glorify us. And listen to me carefully this morning. He woke me up this morning. He allowed me to rise from my bed today to come before you and to come before our live stream camera to tell you about Jesus' death for sin and his resurrection to new life. He rose me up today and put me in these clothes and put me on this platform to invite you to turn from sin, to turn from self, to turn in repentance, and to by faith embrace Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And I want to make this promise to you. And I can only make this promise to you because God has made this promise in His Word. His Word tells us without any contradiction that he will turn no one away who comes to him in faith John 6 37 anyone who comes to me I will in no wise cast out so I say to anyone who's listening if that desire to come to Jesus if that desire to have sins forgiven if that desire to be as God created us to be one day. If, if that desire is in your heart, do understand this. It's because God is using the gospel to work on your heart. And he is opening your eyes and he is drawing you in love. And I say to you, if you feel that in any way, shape, or form, won't you open your heart today and trust him? Won't you do that? Because Scripture is clear. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever doesn't shall not be. But whoever does shall be. And finally, saints. While there's infinite room for gratitude to God for the salvation that he has poured out on you. There is no room for any pride. There are saints who are very proud of themselves. They think because they grew up in a certain denomination. Or because their skin is a certain color. Or because they haven't committed this or that transgression that they are somehow a leg up. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, flat out and true, that's pride, and there's no room for pride in any of us. Gratitude, absolutely. Pride, no way, Jose. I hope that's not improper to say anymore, I don't know. Were you predestined? Yes. But not because of anything you did. Not because of anything God saw in you that drew him to you. Oh, there's Julie. She is a peach of a person. She's loving. She's kind. She calls everybody. She'll sit and counsel with people for hours. I think I'll save her. Well, those things are true of her, but that's not why. If those things are true of her, it's because the Lord has been working those things out in her life. So, are we predestined? According to Scripture, yes. But not because of anything good in us, 
but rather because of God's own good pleasure to make you fit to glorify him and to benefit others by proclaiming the gospel to those around you. That is our mission. And my question to you, saints, is are you open to engaging that mission? Are you open to being equipped so that you can engage it? You were not saved to go to heaven. You will, thank God. But that wasn't the reason. No, he saved us, as our scripture said this morning in verse 10, for good works. We're not saved by good works, but we're saved to do good works. Good works that God had prepared for us before the foundation of the world. I simply want to ask you, saint, okay? We're almost done. We're, we're, I'm fixing to just sprint across the finish line here any second. Will, go ahead and get your team ready. Okay? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works that he prepared beforehand. Are you involved in those? Because if you're saved today, you're his workmanship. You've been recreated in Christ Jesus for good works. Are you involved in some capacity? Father, I pray that you'll take the things that have been shared here today. This is so heavy and so hard, and I'm confident that many questions will come, and that's all right. But Lord, help us, help us to cling to your word, to understand your word, to grow in your word, and the parts that are so difficult that we just can't seem to get our minds wrapped around them. May we just step back in faith and trust that you're working things out according to your will, and someday we'll know. Lord, I pray for those who are hearing this message today who are far from Christ. I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them of sin, draw them to Jesus, and save their soul. And for the believers who need to understand why you save them or how you save them, may these things help them to grow and to understand, not to become haughty or proud, but to be humbled and thankful for all that you've done. And may that motivate us to want to serve you with all that we have for your glory and the benefit of others, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord is our hope and our salvation, and in him we put our trust. So how about if you stand up and let's sing this closing song as we close our time together here. That lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your love and kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, a living hope Yes, yes Who could imagine So great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own Beautiful 
Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Come on, church, let's sing. Hallelujah. So praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Because death has lost its grip on me. Because you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. The death has lost its grip on me. Because you have broken every chain. This salvation. the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on the came the morning and sing the came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe. Heart of the sun, the holy lion, declare, declare that the rain has no rain. We sing, Jesus is yours, Jesus is yours. is he our living hope he's our only hope all right so remember that thank you for coming and being part of the service today um i, I recognize it's kind of heavy but nonetheless it's important things to talk about uh, because they're in the word of god and we need to understand that if you're new to the church we'd love to meet you right over here to my right and your left is a re guest reception pastor brett will be there i think and maybe some other folks and uh, they'd love to meet you. We have a free gift we'd love to give you, and you can answer, qu ask questions about the church and hopefully receive some answers. I'm going to be right here at the front. My wife is going to be right here. One of our elders will be here. If you need someone to pray with you, if you have questions about what we talked about today, um, whatever, we want to minister to you. And so we're here and we're available. Um, 
Did you ever put my slide up on that screen? Okay, good. My contact information was up there. You can also contact me that way as well. Hey, it's going to be a beautiful Sunday. Go in God's love. Go in peace and enjoy this wonderful day.